Well, now, Brian, we have come to the part of the program where we can just sit back and remark what in the wide, wide world of sports were they thinking? Because it's time to talk about AEW. And by the way, folks, this is <laughs> the last week at AEW. I mean, they're colder than a witch's tit, colder than a banker's heart, colder than a well digger's ass. Nobody has even asked, and we haven't bothered to offer that we haven't really talked about AEW since last week's Dynamite, which is now, well, four or five days ago. I can't count anymore. And uh, and nobody's asked about it. Nobody gave a shit, particularly either way. And then they had a collision. <laughs> the, the program on Saturday night was aptly named because of a wide variety of their roster had a headfirst collision with the fucking canvas on Saturday night. And so just for the sake of being responsible journalists and uh, commentators, we will, we will just talk about and try to analyze again as briefly as possible. What do they think they're doing? Do they, they will not change the program for the better because I don't believe they know or realize that it's not good. And it's getting funny, not good, where you just shake, even the faithful are shaking their head at, at this is television. <sighs> so do you, do you, you want to hit some high points from the last week in AEW just to show where they're at after the other folks have had 50,000 people at a fucking stadium to watch a goddamn glorified infomercial? Well, AEW had a red hot dynamite episode on Wednesday. WWE may be in the stadium. But Wembley, but Wembley, the well, stadium and, wasn't as big as Wembley, was it? It just wasn't as big as Wembley. AEW's better, you see? Well, you got that, you got that. Maybe they should run the fucking Coliseum in Greece. And then they'd be the biggest thing in the world. But this was AEW Dynamite from February 21st. Oh, so long ago. We're just now catching up with this thing. And... I don't know. I think WWE may be in a stadium. I think AEW should be in a state home. Uh, they were in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Your old Gla stomping grounds. Grand, glorious old wrestling uh, uh, city and territory there. And boy, howdy. We ran that uh, town in 1984. I believe it was 21 shows Mid-South ran there including setting the all-time city gate record and attendance record four times in that same year. And uh, it ain't as hot down there as it used to be. So they opened up with, for whatever reason that FTR is being punished, are they potentially the new lead characters in one of those Ryan Murphy, sorry sack of shit, creepy, scary programs that don't make any sense, where they just can't get out of a fucking horrible booking scenario wherever they go. They move from place to place. They're traveling gypsies, and everywhere it's like, how can we fuck with these guys? They were forced to compete against the plumber, Moxley, and... Poor old Claudio Castagnoli, who at this point is, is he wallpaper or is he one of those garden statues that the bushes have grown up and you don't really notice it anymore? I think he's the same as he's always been. Someone that a lot of people in the business really love his work, but he's, you know, he doesn't stand out. Well, I, I mean, he's, he's been, he's been painted over, I think, in the corner. It's, it's just stuck with this fucking goof and this nowhere gimmick and you never hear. They used to like when he did the swing. He doesn't do the swing. And it, Jerry, there's no swing. But anyway, it, it, I'll say it briefly. Every time that Moxley is in with a real professional wrestler, it's aggravating to me because guys who have talent have to tolerate doing the shit that this bald, pale, broken-down trailer trash acting like he's fucking a member of the Gracie family likes to do it's to prove he's a badass when everybody with eyes is seeing a clumsy, awkward, fake-looking... <sighs> so he, he, was the, he was the black sheep of the family. He was the, the son of Eleanor Gracie. Eleanor Gracie had the baby that would become the plumber one day. 
Hoist went away. All right. So Moxley, at one point, tried to drop behind on a vertical suplex. It, I, I can't remember if it was Dax or Cash, but they were just like holding him there, waiting for him. Just, Please, just drop on behind. They had him, and he just fell on his ass. And he continues to work like your unemployed uncle that sells weed, getting into a fight at a family picnic. So... <sighs> Well, I mean, if, if you sell weed, technically you're self-employed, I would imagine. Well, you, you, I guess, have an independent contractor classification in some states now. Those are always the most pathetic people, the weed dealers who somehow don't make any money. Yeah, yeah. They, then you could say they're unemployed. They're just losers. If, if you're going to be goddamn selling illegal, illicit, or otherwise substances that may get you time boarding with the warden on the bounty of the county the lee you could be living the high life over it driving to maserati and 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 what but being the player with the bitches and all of whatever <laughs> whatever the young people do these days <laughs> stood out there like a fucking weirdo sitting on a teeter-totter with your teetering but nobody's there to totter you so Moxley gave a cold tag to Claudio, and Claudio made a comeback. I'm trying to... Are the BBC the baby faces, but FTR are not heels? They're baby... Well, they've cooled off significantly. They were raving baby faces before they were beaten like your fucking grandmother's rug. The BCC are definitely heels. Well, then they made a comeback, and the, and the fucking baby faces fed and bumped for them. Uh, and then 15 minutes into the goddamn show, we go to break. And then they came back, and then they did simultaneous cold tags, and Cash made a comeback. So they switched in mid-match. And I, I figured out a gimmick for Moxley. Instead of the plumber or having a tool belt or whatever that would make up for his fucking... He's, you know, I've seen people with a sunken chest before, but he has a sunken fucking torso. Everything is sunken from his chest to his goddamn abdomen. Anyway, you t put him in green scrubs, right? And and one of those fucking green caps and everything, and and put a fucking name tag uh, bracelet on him, right? One of those white things has your information, and make him a guy from a state home that walked away after getting too many shock treatments. And now he's come to the wrestling promotion, and one of the managers snatches him up. I don't know if that would work in uh, 2024. That might be a problem. Escape mental patients? Well, goddamn, maybe he's, he's been gone for a while. See, he's, time has passed him by. What if he did like a Sid Barrett? Like he shows up again in four years and he's fat and bald. How would you tell the difference? Well, he's not fat. Well, he's bald enough to uh, compensate for that. He looks fat, even though he's fucking emaciated, because what is there is not delineated in any way. Anyway, they did the call for five minutes remaining. And so now they're, they're going to do this. The, the criticism that we levied apparently has been heard on this, this small thing and ignored on major points. But here is what the spot they did where Dax and Cash, they're, they have a wonderful double team move where Dax does the superplex and Cash does the splash off the top and they land bang, bang, right? Very. 80s tag teamy, very Midnight Expressy, very Heart Foundation, -y, very whatever the fuck. You talking about the Superplex spot? The Superplex. That's and Power the and Glory. That's uh, that's Power and Glory. That was their well, finishing move. Yeah, well, there you go. They did it too. But it's a very reminiscent of an 80s tag team. Well, in which they were that you know the double team maneuvers that all the tag teams were noted for. And this fucking guy decides he's going to kill their fucking move because he's an idiot. Do you know what? If Dax gave Moxley a superplex, right? And how many, how long is it usually after they land before Cash lands with the, the, uh, the splash? It's usually pretty quick right after. They time it pretty well. Bam, bam, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So think about this now that I'm breaking it down for you. Dax gives Moxley the superplex, and as soon as they land, Moxley raises his knees so that Cash lands on his fucking knees and Cash hurts himself. The guy that took... 
was given a superplex off the top rope and was smashed down into the middle of the fucking ring off the top rope by this goddamn guy's superplex within less than one second was so unfazed by it. I'll just raise my knees and catch this other motherfucker. Boom. And then Tanyan gets up and starts hitting him with phony elbows. How much, what, where is the logic in that? How could that be a thing that you would ever think? And why did FTR tolerate it if it was called ahead of time, which apparently it was or else wise cash would have squashed him. Well, this whole match seemed to be like a battle between FDR trying to work a wrestling match and Moxley only wanting to work the Moxley match. Wanting to chew on somebody's face or kiss them. Sell nothing, you know, really do very little to sell anything or put anything over. And then Claudio gets into the mix and now he sells nothing too. Well, he can't let his fucking, you know, emaciated little partner look better than he does with that body. So he's, you know, now it's a... (laughs) It's a skyscrapers thing. Only one guy is not scraping the sky. He's scraping the bottom of the barrel. So it turned into a constant four-way. At one point, Dax and Claudio broke out into a girl's slap fight. Uh, And then FTR go for the shatter machine on uh, uh, Moxley, I believe it was. And the bell rings as they're about to give it. And so Dax holds up and they don't give it to him. And it's a 20 minute draw. So now I guess what they're going to do is they're going to reinforce the idea. We talked about the criticism, but that you call it and then you end at 1930 or whatever. They're going to make sure everybody knows whenever they hear the time call, it's a draw. You Um, You had to say something and now they're doing this nonstop. Yeah. But anyway, everybody sat there for a while and the fans were pissed and then all four of them got in a sloppy fight and the security and the agents separated them and they had to pull apart. And, you know, we were almost half an hour into the show at this point. But that's, I just can't, Moxley is unwatchable. And it's it's funny at this point if you didn't feel bad for some of his opponents on a professional level, which I do. I don't know how much I could add to that. I didn't like the match because it seemed like it was too much of a struggle between styles. You know, Moxley and Claudio could have been strong while working a match, but it's just, I don't know. They're too much in their own... Moxley's too much in his own head. And, you know, physique-wise, because you brought it up earlier, wanting to be a tough guy, actually being a tough guy, and looking like a tough guy are three different things. And you need to try to have two out of the three, don't you? You do. And I don't know. I I don't see it. And FTR always looks like shit. They make it so that a team that got itself over in spite of the bad booking, with a few changes like new Midnight Express music and getting rid of Tully Blanchard and being used a little better, get themselves over to become the most popular tag team in the company over the EVPs which upset plenty of people. They get a couple runs as tag team champions. They hold multiple titles in other companies, apparently, too. They re-signed their contract. They had those classic matches with, or that one specifically with Juice and Jay White. Well, what they did with the Briscoes, just not in in AEW, but in front of the world on, you know, the internet was... uh, And then the House of Black started kicking the shit out of them. (laughs) I never saw what resolution there was there. They chased me off before I could see that on Collision. Now they're on Dynamite. The BCC's kicking the shit out of them. Tully, I mean, I know they love Tully and Arn. Tully and Arn never just got the shit kicked out of them. Like, you know, like the Midnight Express, it happened to them once. Once when Paulie and the Midnight Express came. Like, it never, it wasn't just like one program into another of laying there because you got your ass kicked. I, I don't I don't understand why they book FTR like that. I don't understand any of this. And I, I want to know what Dax's singles record is. There are big statis- statisticians there in that company. What is Dax's singles record for the entire time that he's been in AEW? And what is Cash's singles record? And how come we don't see more of Cash? Because whenever you lose the thought that, you know, sometimes you could be like, man, Dax is really good. And then you start watching Cash, you're like, man, I think Cash might be even fucking better. That's what I'm saying. But it's Dax that is in all the singles matches and loses every single one of them. 
and you never see Cash, and he's phenomenal as well. And I'm not, he's probably at home if he's listening to this now. Say, oh, shut the fuck up. He's shooting his gun the, in the air. Pew, pew, pew. No, no, hey, I'll do I don't like this. Pew. The, but that's the thing. Is then if they do that, then they'll bring him in and beat him like a goddamn drum, too. But. Uh, <laughs> oh, come Cash on. Cash Wheeler's now. in the house. Duck. Hey, come on. Hey, Pillman. Come on now. Watch out. Uh, but but you know what I mean is the the only thing they they split him up in singles and Dax is always the one that does a job at every match and and then they get the shit kicked out of him as tag as a tag team most of the time. You could talk about whatever with the AEW booking specifically with tag teams they don't know how to get over tag team feuds and they cut the J White Juice Robinson thing off at the knees and now look at it Juice <laughs> Robinson's out has J White done anything that matters since then. Not really. Well, he's in the gangbang scissor clan. Well, more about them later. They had a wonderful weekend oh, as well. Oh boy. Right? All right. <laughs> well, let, let's let's move on from poor FTR because we got to go to poor Mike Bennett. And I don't if people didn't like Mike Bennett for the last few years. I haven't seen he's been in Ring of he was in Ring of Honor and and the internet doesn't like him or whatever the fuck. I don't know what their problem is, but the Mike Bennett that I knew and the one that I still see when I see glimpses of him being able to have a wrestling match with one of these people, he can work and when they came in new, he and Taven athletic experienced guys why wouldn't you give them a few wins as a tag team just to establish them with a beautiful maria there instead of just starting them off as flunkies getting beat but nevertheless they put him in a singles match against the fucking mascot and gave it 10 minutes of national tv time and a guy that had that kind of potential has to against stooge for the boss's pet and then when Taven comes in and Roddy comes in strong and they beat up pockets, then Jake Hager runs in and makes the save. He's still here. He is still getting paid by this company to do fucking what? Well, he's from Oklahoma, right? He's a local boy. Is he from well, Tulsa? But, he, I don't, they announce him from Oklahoma. I don't, I guess he is, but... It, it, what did he just drop by and he couldn't contain himself and he went out there to fucking run him off? They're obviously still using him for some reason, which escapes me. And then... Because Chris Jericho asked them to sign him early on. Well, listen to this now. As soon as he runs in the ring and runs the heels off or whatever, the announcers are screaming, well, Tony Khan has just informed us, it's 10 seconds, that... Strong versus Hager will be on Rampage on Friday. I'm glad Tony's Johnny on the spot with making these fucking matches in 10 seconds when he can't fucking write the ship of his company. Fans, don't worry. If this is something you don't want to see, the match will be on Rampage Friday. To well, no there one. you have it. Um... I guess they've been doing something on the internet or at some point or in, maybe in one of these backstage breaks that we don't even pay any attention to, but old, the former Jericho jobber, cool hand Luke with the, the comb, he combs his hair. He's not daddy, he's daddy Mac's partner. He's not daddy Mac. He's daddy Mac's skinny partner with the bland face. Face looks like fucking oatmeal with no sugar. He was in the back with Rene Moxley Good, and apparently he's all nervous because he's going on a date, the first date he's had with Ruby Soso. Are these people adults? What the fuck? And we not, Ruby looks about, what, 30? This guy's got to be mid-20s? He's nervous because he's going on a date with Ruby. What the f Who is the audience here? Is the audience going on a date? I think not. Well, this is a big deal. The French Canadian Fonzie is gonna go out and try to strike it, strike it rich, strike it, uh, have a good time. I don't strike know what he's gonna do. He's, he's gonna strike <laughs> it rich. He's gonna he's gonna score four touchdowns no. for Monami High. When I see segments like this, I'm happy they decided to hire a soap opera writer. That'll certainly help steer the ship. <laughs> well, at least maybe they'll be having fucking some kind of adult conversation, like he's nervous because the pregnancy test went the wrong way. Yeah, 
These back so, these backstage segments with Renee Moxley good as like the the jovial host of all these wacky characters is not doing it. Uh, well, speaking of her jovialness uh, herself, she was in the back with Ric Flair, and Ric Flair has come in, and his story is he's disappointed. Because he signed up to be part of Sting's retirement. And remember, he cut that promo. He said, I want to be with you every step of the way. We haven't seen him for a fucking month and a half or whatever, right? So he said, well, I signed up to be part of Sting's retirement. I wanted to be more involved. And, and, he's, and, and he's trying to tell this story. And it's kind of like they just told it to him right before they said, and roll him. Because he's not really making his declarative statements as he normally does. So he said he's exploring his options and he goes and knocks on a fucking door and the door opens and it's the buckaroo's office and they let him in and close the door. So now are we going to get Ric Flair at this stage of his career turning on Sting to favor the EVPs all because of the woo? energy drink sponsorship i don't know what the what is going on here now maybe they'll go the other way and this will be the way they tease one week out that there's a relationship between flair and the bucks and then flair doesn't turn on sting double crossing the bucks giving them a loss and now they can feud with rick flair after sting's gone okay but then what is it? <laughs> <laughs> because if <laughs> And if they're trying to be the heels against Sting, it's Greensboro. The only person that they would cheer probably over Sting would be Flair. You would think so, yeah. So what, I don't know what they're <laughs> trying to tease here or not tease or what the goddamn. And I mean, and, and by the way, again, Matt, Maddie and Nikki, the kids there, they're getting paid to show up and open the fucking dressing room door for a, an appearance on television. So then Tony Schiavone was in the ring and introduced old Danny Garcia. And now we're going interview, interview, interview. We've had backstage, we've had in the ring, and I'm thinking it's the WWE formula they're trying to do. It's all talk, but there's no stars. No stars, that's the problem. There's no stars. It looks like they invited the parking attendant to come in and comment on the show with Tony bringing his guy in a ring. And at the pay-per-view, it's going to be Garcia against Christian Cage for the TNT title. So I have a... Uh, and they, they, can they not elevate a young person with hair, with hair and personality? Well, he has hair. He just has a short haircut. He has no, hair. No, I would not. Well, we don't want to see short haired people that look like they work at Dunkin' Donuts. We want to see rock stars, don't we? Every one of their interchangeable, bland, white fellows with fucking buzz cuts and black tights. Well, I don't know if he's a white guy. He, uh, his last name's Garcia. Maybe a Latino. Well, he's he's too light for me. Hey, look on the bright side. At least it's not we or Yuta. Where the fuck did he go? Maybe he got sepsis. I'm I'm not complaining. <laughs> I'm not complaining. But maybe sepsis? Mersa. Maybe Mersa. Mersa Yuta. Woo, Mersa. Hepatitis. Oh. Did you catch what Danny Garcia <laughs> said in his promo, the, 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 the premise of his promo at the start? You know, I saw him at the media scrum one or two events ago. Maybe it was the last one. And he seems like a very nice guy, and he was very grateful. And the whole thing just became about how he wants to make sure everyone knows how grateful he is. It, it it was well no he wasn't grateful here he was actually kind of ungrateful it was very rah rah you know i'm happy to be here yeah well this this was he started out this fucking mope faced bland he's got nothing going on right i don't know what i could have done with him in ovw past the middle of the card he can function to do moves but there's there's no there's no gimmick there's no personality there's no look there's no attire, whatever, physique. 
But he starts out saying, you know, everybody always told me I was going to be great. <laughs> what the fuck? Well, they were lying to you, pal. No, everybody always told me I was going to be great. I would have people, guys in the back coming up to me. Oh, you're going to be great. You're going to be the best and this and that. And I'm like, but then he's, but I lost confidence in myself. And then he starts the the dreariness. You know, I lost confidence. Could I do it? Whatever. But the you, the fans, you guys picked me up. And and then he came out there and said, I know if last week my match against Edge had gone on longer, I would have made Edge tap out. Oh, God. And the next time that Edge sees me, I'm going to be the TNT champion. And now I'm thinking, who's the baby face? Now he's... Uh, not he instead of saying you know something like i was fortunate that i gave it everything i got last week and i was able to hang in the ring with a hall of fame talent like edge and it could have gone either way but i thought i had him or something to, to, to give some humility to, to the position he was obviously given that he's not ready for last but anyway so he's cutting that fucking promo and then finally Two minutes before nine o'clock, Christian Cage music with Nick Plain and Nick Plain's mom and Dino Douche. And think about this, Brian. Picture them in your mind. Christian, Nick, Nick's mom and Dino, Dollar Store Judgment Day. You see it now? I can kind of see it, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking they're getting a lot of inspiration. And Christian promos Garcia, he ain't ready. That went on forever. And then he goes into the, I understand, Garcia, you had a tough childhood, and it could, your father is dead. More of this. This is the worst. And your father was a loser alcoholic, and I want to be your father. Remember at one point when Christian promos were the highlight or one of the highlights of the show, and now it's he's got these the amateur hour with him and it's, you know, dead fathers. And he's, I don't, I don't know. The what whole are these thing guys, is going sideways. Here's the counter to all this. You're in the ring and he says this awful thing about you. Just go, you cheat on your wife. That would, complete, yeah. that would throw him off base. How are you going to answer yeah. that? I don't, I really don't. Yeah, what are you going to say? When did you quit? I didn't. When oh, was the last you time quit? you beat up your wife? When was the last time you did it? I never have done that. Sound like a guilty man, Christian. But no, everyone plays into his hands. <laughs> well, speaking of playing into his hands, um, he sends Nick to the ring, but Garcia gets him in a sharpshooter, which is the first thing you do. You immobilize, your, you tangle your legs in someone else and immobilize them and yourself while there's three other people that can fucking bombard you from behind. But Dino comes to the ring, and old Mac Daddy appears out of nowhere and hits Dino with the chair, and... Then he rolls in the ring and gives Garcia a chair, and they hold off Christian Cage and the entire company. There's Danny Garcia and one of the ex-Jericho jobbers now are being involved in angles. I wrote, good Lord. So that was that. You know, this is another AEW pay-per-view. This happened with the New Year's one. I mean, you have the Sting match. And really, Sting retiring is the event, but there's like nothing to look forward to on this card. Oh, we do No, there's more. There's more to come. Oh. Tony Storm wrestled some girl that found a place to buy tights and did... D uh, Tony won the match by doing Deanna Perrazzo's move, right? So... One would think that now the next match, because we got two girls' matches in a row in the death slot, Deanna Perrazzo against Madison Rain. And one would think that, well, then maybe Deanna's going to do Tony's thing or something like that or whatever, but we don't know really what was going to exactly happen. Yeah, she showed Tony. She said, You want to do my thing? Look what I could do. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is your future. This, uh, this started and it was and we'd already had the and the other girl, by the way, with Tony Storm. I, 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 I mean, I know they can't just beat all their regular girls. They need to have some come in. But how in the world did this pass? Quality check. This girl looked like she was second 
week in wrestling school. So uh, for the record, her, her name, Tony Storm's opponent was Cindy Winnell. I'm I'm betting she's going to change it if she spends any more time in this business. But anyway, now this, the second girl's bed goes through the break. And when they came back from the break, I started watching because they were lost. And Madison Rain, uh, you know, she was in TNA for a while with the, when I was there with the beautiful people or whatever the case. She's been in the business for a while. I believe they've hired her as one of the trainers. And a trainer, a coach, an agent, one of coach, those. Coach, agent, yeah. whatever for the for the young ladies. And she's been known to have good matches, nice matches. And Deanna Perrazzo is well thought of, from what we understand, having good matches. It they were lost. They couldn't get it. They had a double knockout and started talking to each other when they were down, trying to get it back together. But when they got up, I'm wondering if maybe somebody's bell hadn't got rung already because it was like they were so mud. They were doing swing dancing in slow motion. And then finally, Deanna goes for... I don't know what they call it or, you know, whatever, but the, where you grab the, the other person and you fall backward and face plant them. Or at least that's what it looked like she was trying to give Madison Rain because when, when that happened, Madison Rain somehow believed in her heart of hearts that whatever she was being given, she had to take a front flip for. And between one planning to plant her on her face and the other one thinking she's going to do a front flip and land on her back, she landed right on the top of her head. And the crowd went, ooh, and the referee instantly slid in there and the doctor got up and came to the ring like, you know, this is all happening very quickly and there was some... I know some communication passed, and suddenly Deanna Prazo just grabs Madison Rain's foot and puts an ankle lock on her, and Madison Rain taps. And that was that. It, 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 ah. And I mean, it's not like that that was an unfortunate accident on a, a match that was just going swimmingly because they were already having just not a, not a good match. But, but that had to... It, if you played that tape and said, and unfortunately, Madison Rain never wrestled again, you would believe it, right? Yeah, and it was in front of a dead crowd. The crowd doesn't react to these women's segments. They may react to the pinfall finally, but they sit there and watch politely like it's Tokyo in 1972. And I always go on about the problems at AEW's women's division, which is always awful. This is one of the leaders you would think of it. They hired her when there were issues with the women's division, Come in the back, help out. Be someone that can help with finishes or help with moves or whatever. And she almost died in the ring. They dropped her on her head. <laughs> and Deanna Parasa is supposed to be one of the better ones. The match was terrible. This whole division is terrible. And now they're going to double down on it, bringing in Mercedes Monet. We'll see. I mean, unless they could just change the division wholesale and... Make it a whole new thing. Well, now, hold on a sec, because they weren't even done here, because after they got the spatula and removed poor Madison Rain, Tony Storm hit the ring, because they still had an angle to do. And Tony Storm hits the ring and ankle locks Deanna Perrazzo. And I'm, and I'm thinking, my God, Punk versus MJF didn't get this kind of promotion on the television. As this... Sudden blood feud between Tony Storm and Deanna Perrazzo. And then they replayed the botch where Madison Rain was almost fucking decapitated as the sponsored move of the night. Did you see that? Yeah, no, I was grateful for that because I didn't have to rewind it in real time to see it because I had to see it again. So I was happy they did that. It's, but who's going to sponsor that? The goddamn pain clinic? The fucking spinal fucking clinic that does the goddamn surgeries and fuses your... Spine to your goddamn sphincter. Here's the Chris Nowinski move of the night. Oh. <laughs> don't All worry. Right. If you think he may be offended by that, don't worry. We'll just give him money. That seems to placate him. Oh, that's now that's being slandered around about poor Nowinski, for heaven's sake. 
what they don't know. He won't say boo about the people who pay him that we don't know the veracity of this yet. Oh, okay. No, we don't. Besides, what you what can you expect from a guy that got brain damage? It's just a so, rumor. I, I know that because I just started it. Well, the, <laughs> so the one bright spot on this program, Sting finally did a good interview. We've been waiting for it for so long. Um, and I, obviously, I don't I don't know whether everybody knows, but it was the news was released uh that sting's father passed away i guess like last week as we speak now or whatever a few days before this program and so he wasn't there live but darby allen went to his house and they recorded something and he you know he not only finally got around to mentioning hey you guys beat up my sons right uh they're finally acknowledging the that they did that angle but he referenced his father passing away and and you know thinking about his own mortality and blah 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 and you know if this was great if he was talking about opponents that anybody cared about i would think it would do land office business on pay-per-view the building's already sold out just because they want to see his last match but and the pay-per-view will do well for that but you know what a letdown of a a match and hopefully we don't have as we mentioned before, Flair doing what we're afraid he might do. No, I think it's going to go the other way. Because I don't. The more I think about it, the more I don't think they could end that night with Sting losing for his last match in Greensboro. What one would think, but then what the? But then why are they the tag team champions? Why did they shoehorn the tag team title into this so that the Buckaroos can win a tournament by beating FTR again along with others? Maybe the Young Bucks lose. And they're going to need someone to blame. And who could the EVPs blame but Tony Khan? And now he gets to be an on-air character. The babyface Tony Khan against the evil EVPs that are empowered by him and the contracts he gave them. Guaranteed by his father. So he can't do anything. And then you bring his dad out. As the new heel manager of the Young Bucks. He towers over them. Looks like the great Gama. Scary looking man. And Tony has to put together a group of renegade new japan pro wrestlers <laughs> to go to battle with his dad over billions and a super yacht i think it could work i think it could work <sighs> only if the television program takes place from the deck of the luxury super yacht where a ring has been placed and they just sail them around the world having matches i mean jericho may sue over the concept but just knock him out just knock him out just knock him out. Knock him out, John! All right, so Tony Schiavone was in the ring and introduced Wardlow, and Wardlow got in the ring and told Tony to fucking get lost and kicks the announcer out of the ring. This was the highlight of the whole episode for me. That uh, Here we have another shoot promo about how bad something has been on this television show by people on this television show that he actually said two years ago, I had thousands of people chanting my name. I was the next big thing, blah, blah, blah. But the rocket on my back was placed upside down. And he did a promo about how badly he's been booked. How he never got a title shot. And there's people back there that need to be fired over it. Well, who are those people, Tony? Who's going to fire him? Hey, Shad. Yeah, who, who, who could he be talking about? Someone needs to be fired. Who? Tony Khan can make a match in 10 seconds when a guy runs in to make a fucking save, but he Wardlow's been there for five years, and he could just go, hey, Tony, I want a title match. And apparently he did, and apparently Tony said, fuck you, and apparently that's why Tony needs to be fired, according to Wardlow. What the f they do? It's not explicable. It's not logical. And he said, the best in the world, the real champion, right? Like he rolls his eye. Yeah, remind us, CM Punk never lost his fucking belt. So it's not even a goddamn real lineage that the current champion is on. He, he said, I beat him so bad, his body is still falling apart. And meanwhile, he's selling more t-shirts to make more money than you're making per year while his body is falling apart. And they can't get over Punk. And then... He mentioned that, you know what, Samoa Joe, I choked him out and beat him too. 
When did he do that? When they were not pushing Joe before they decided, oh, he should be our world champion? They feuded over the TNT title, I think, at one point. Well, they poor pre-planning. Let's, you know... Oh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, he did a good emotional promo, because we've said before, ooh, he just bland ass. Yeah, so he was fired up here, he was pissed off, and he, he really was pissed off. That's the thing. It was all about his bad booking, and he meant everything he said. He'd been booked into irrelevance when he was a fucking Goldberg level for them. And then Tony didn't know what the fuck to do, and then Wardlow didn't know what the fuck to do, because he'd never done it before. And nobody fucking, I guess, bothered to tell him. So... Go, go out there and let your frustration come out in a promo is one thing. Go out there and let everyone know how badly we have fucked up everything with you. Yes. Is another. I don't know yes. who worked with him on that promo, but someone should have been able to say, let your anger out. Don't bury the company. <laughs> Well, anyway, um, and then is there going to be any follow-up to him doing this, or is it going to be, well, in the six weeks later, we'll see, well, there's Wardlow. Yeah, by the way, this is still a weird promo, because technically he's still a heel. I mean, this was like a babyface promo. He's out there in front of the crowd, yeah. getting, getting them back behind him for the first yes. time in forever. He's in the Undisputed Kingdom. Yes, he's a devil's henchman. He's as heel as they come. He works for Satan himself. Old Scratch, Mephistopheles. <sighs> so then, did you notice that they had an interview with Phallus and Hobbs and our boy Take, and they're talking about the Take versus Will Ostrich match, and they still can't explain why they're having it. It's going to be a great match. Non-wrestler of the year. <laughs> Well, I can't mean you got to give him the reason. I guess he doesn't know either. How can he tell us when he don't know? And in the main event was a six-man tag team match with Hook and Rob Van Dam and Hangnail Page versus Brian Cage, Swerve Strickland, and Samoa Joe. So, yes, you are correct, ladies and gentlemen. The world champion and his top challenger team up with a preliminary jack-off to face his, the world champion's other challenger for this Sunday on pay-per-view, a preliminary guy and a legend in his 50s for no apparent reason. Big main event. And the entrances started about 25 minutes before 10 o'clock Eastern. The, the bell didn't ring for about eight minutes, but they had 17 minutes on the air and they still went over time. And I didn't go over with him. What I miss? Not too much. I don't even remember what the finish was. Uh, I just care less and less once it goes into overrun too. It's almost like, come on, you know, my other shows are starting now. It's ten o'clock. <laughs> the fuck? Well, I'm I'm long past in Slumberland at at ten o'clock at night Eastern time, but uh, my DVR is awake and it would record it if if they would ever tell the cable companies what they plan on doing. See, to me, the stupidest thing about this whole thing was, again, crowd reactions. Adam Page is the heel, yet he's teaming with the baby faces. Yeah. And swerves over like a baby face, teaming with the top heel, as well as the other heel stable member in his own stable. Yeah. <sighs> well, that was dynamite. Did anybody watch this fiasco this week? I believe some people did. Let me pull up the numbers here. We'll, we'll run through their numbers quickly, and then just, again, they did have a collision, and we want to try to give, give you a couple of instances of what they did on national television on Saturday night and, and as their, I guess, answer to what the WWE did on Saturday morning, which was have a stadium show in front of 50,000 people. But go ahead, we're, we're still on the ratings for Wednesday. We are on the ratings, AEW Dynamite on TBS, Wednesday, February 21st, 2024, 8 to 10.05 p.m. These were compiled by WrestleNomics. The overall number, Jim, 828,000 viewers on average. Eh. And it's up well, two, it's up two percent from last week, which was eight hundred and eleven thousand. I was about to say they, uh, you know, they've made a, a slight comeback from almost dropping below eight hundred thousand last week, but uh, we're still right in that pocket there, right in that range. 
They they better hope that all these people are in good health. Well, again, let's go to the quarterly breakdown because this tells the real story. And again, this is the same story every single week. Quarter one, eight to eight fifteen p.m. FTR versus Claudio and Moxley, nine hundred and ninety six thousand viewers. And the Big Bang has been uh, well under a million here the past few weeks. So this is a little bit of an increase. They're getting handed as a gift. Well, the gift continues into quarter two, 8.15 to 8.30 p.m., the continuation of that big tag match with picture-in-picture ads and the post-match and the Orange Cassidy backstage angle, followed by another ad break, 870,000 viewers. Ouch. So 126,000 automatically said we cannot watch the plumber. Well, quarter three, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m., a recap of something. It doesn't say what. A <laughs> recap. Uh, FTR, Claudio, and Moxley backstage angle. And Orange Cassidy versus Mike Bennett with picture-in-picture -picture ads. 799,000 viewers. Good Lord. So they're below 800,000. It's only 45 minutes into the show. I, I sense that by their average, they almost have to pull out of their normal tailspin pattern, but lead me on. We go to quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m., the post-match of Orange Cassidy versus Mike Bennett with the Undisputed Kingdom, and Jake Hager, the Ruby Soho, Angelo Parker date set up, <laughs> the biggest thing since Ralph Mouth went out with Leather Tuscadero. Ric Flair's backstage arrival, <laughs> an ad break, Flair and the Bucks backstage angle, I guess part two of the arrival, and Daniel Garcia's live promo in confrontation with the Christian Cage Bunch, 819,000 viewers. So whatever that mess was that you just described got 20,000 back. Well, let's see where those people can go. 9 p.m., the big 9 o'clock hour. I think we can tell them where to go, but... Uh... <laughs> Quarter 5, 9 to 9.15 p.m., the continuation of the Garcia-Christian gang promo confrontation. Adam Page, Hook, and RVD's backstage promo. Tony Storm versus Sydney... Sydney... Sydney. Yes, it is Sydney. Sydney Winelli. Or not, not Winelli, just Winnell. There's a semicolon there. I thought it was an I. Sydney Winnell. And Madison Rain versus Deanna Perrazzo of Picture in Picture ads. 829,000 viewers. Good Lord, they actually picked up 10,000. Was that just the top of the hour, or was there anything in there that people might have wanted to see? That's a great question. Maybe the next quarter will answer part of it. 9.15 to 9.30 p.m., quarter six. The continuation of Madison Rain versus Deanna Perrazzo. Ouch. Including post-match concussion, uh, including post-match <laughs> with Tony Storm. And the Darby Allen and Sting tape promo, an ad break, and the Wardlow live promo, 789,000 viewers. Okay, I have a feeling it might be downhill from here, but there goes another uh, eh, 40,000. We go now to quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. The Bang Bang Scissor Gang backstage promo, an ad break, the Don Callis Group backstage promo, and the start of Samoa Joe, Brian Cage, and Swerve Strickland versus Adam Page, Hook, and Rob Van Dam. 777,000 viewers. Well, that's only another... 12,000. It, it could be worse. It could get worse. Well, we go to quarter eight. I remind you, there's a five minute overrun. Quarter eight, 9 45 to 10 p.m. The continuation of that big six man match with picture in picture ads. 756,000 viewers. Ouch. Five minute overrun, 805,000 viewers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for that last five minutes on purpose, 40, 49,000 people are going to say, oh, we got to see the finish. So they started at 996,000, and they finished at 10 p.m. Eastern with 756,000. That means they lost 240,000, which was 25%, almost exactly, 
of the audience they started with. Woo. Watch out, WWE. 